All right, I just got to go share us over on the Facebook, but we're live now. On the Facebook, I just said it like a parent, like an older parent would say it. I got to share it on the Facebook. <laughs> You guys can talk if you want. You don't have to. No pressure, <laughs> but talk. <laughs> we like to talk and not talk. Deep soup. Are you guys doing any special this weekend, Michael? Um, I know we'll talk about that again, but. We, well, we've got a burger day that's sold out on Saturday, but then unfortunately we sold out of our Zen two weeks ago. So I've got a <laughs> blend or two, but I, I don't have any Zen for Zen Fest. I'm kind of heartbroken. Oh, no. And well, you guys? after 2020, it could be worse. I think that's a good problem to have. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have Zen. We have our first, our second ever Zen, actually. Oh. We're, we're just kind of doing the normal stuff, but yeah, that'll be fun to pour. Yeah. It's a little difficult to try to work on event type stuff. Seeing people's almost good enough for me right now. Yep. <laughs> we, we were able to do our burger days last year and that went off pretty good. I mean, we it used to be like 300 people at a time and kind of stand in line, come as you are. Now it's more two seatings, come in, you get a little bit of time and then thanks so much bring in the sanitize, then bring in the next seating. I kind of like the wiggle room we all get right now. Everyone gets space and time and attention. It's nice. It's a nice yeah, time to uh, visit. Versus the past where you saw a couple people here and there. Now I get time to kind of make my way to each table and greet them. And so that's, that, there's a better connection there, I think. Right on, you guys Beth, are you should come out and take on Facebook now. So we, we are there. There's a little bit of a lag, of course. And uh, I see a few people checking in already. We've got Steve and Martha Hewitt over in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, rainy over there, but it looks like they're having a Twisted Spur 12, 2012 Twisted Spur. We're getting a Twisted Spur today, a 17, <laughs> which is pretty rad. Thank you for sharing that, Katie. Uh, and then let's see, David uh, from San Diego saying hello. You're heading up for ZinFest, right on. Very good, very good. Um, right on, all right. Very cool. So let's uh, let's get going. Uh, hey everyone, Chris Toronto with the Paso Wine Hour, uh, coming to you from Paso. A beautiful sunny day uh, today with a little bit of rain actually. So it was kind of an interesting, weird uh, little day of, of a splash and dash. I don't know if you guys saw any of that. Uh, but uh, we are talking about SIP, sustain, uh, SIP certification, which uh, stands for Sustainability in Practice. Uh, and we're going to get into the nitty gritty of what that actually means here. Uh, it's perfect for uh, the day after Green Day, because this is kind of like uh, the, the whole greening of the, of the wine industry, right? Uh, but then it's also ahead of next week or next month's uh, Earth Day uh, in April. And so we're, we get to talk a little bit about how these practices are kind of best translated into the wine that you drink and what the process is that goes into it. So today we have Michael Barreto uh, from Oso Libre Winery, Katie Bruce from Niner Wine Estates, and of course, Beth Bukmanik from Vineyard Team. Uh, Michael, let's start with you real quick. Say hello. Hello, uh, my name is Michael Barreto from Oso Libre Winery. I am a winemaker and partner up here. Um, Steve, we are a small little estate consisting of 90 acres total. Um, of that, 15 is planted in grapevines, and the rest is uh, grazing a land, land for uh, cattle and sheep and alpacas we have on the property. Uh, we made our first wines in 2003. Uh, on the property, we have Cabernet Sauvignon, Primitivo, and Movedra, Movedra planted. Um, and... Um, we're primarily direct to consumer. You're not going to see much of us out there um, in stores and such, uh, but we find a lot of uh, traffic come through, find us, and uh, not really culty, but kind of niche. And uh, people that find us usually like us, and we really appreciate that. Right on, right on. Well, good to have you on, Michael. I know you haven't been on uh, this program. We haven't had Osa Libre uh, either, so great to have you on. 
Uh, Katie Bruce, it's almost like you actually have to say your first name and your last name always. It's not just Katie, it's Katie My Bruce. My whole life, it's not just you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> All right on, say hello. Hello everyone, Katie Bruce, um, marketing manager here at Niner Wine Estates. Um, Hewitt's, I know you guys have been out and done a tour and done the whole thing. If you guys haven't been, we're actually right on the way to Oso Libre. Michael and I were talking about that earlier on the west side. Um, tasting room that opened in 2010, family owned and operated, all estate grown, uh, the Twisted Spur. I brought a bottle and shared it with everyone today. That's coming from the property right behind the estate there. Um, if you've been out for lunch, you probably know we've got a pretty killer lunch program, different than the burgers at Oso, which are fantastic. Um, but it's fun to see everyone kind of striking out there and making sure you guys have stuff to nibble on while you're tasting. And yeah, that's what I got, Chris. All right, right on, right there at the famous Heart Hill Vineyard. Heart uh, Hill. That, that's the, like so iconic here in Paso when you're driving along Highway 46 West. Uh, Beth Bukmanic Lopez, uh, Vineyard Team. Beth, say hello. Hi, I'm Beth and I am the program director for SIP Certified, which is a project of Vineyard Team. So a lot of people nowadays, myself included, like to shop our values. And so we find more and more consumers are looking for sustainable wines, but aren't always sure how to find them. So what our certification program does is it helps wine growers implement good practices that take care of the people and the planet. So that when you see that SIP certified seal, you know that the wine's been made sustainably. And um, I think where we're going with in this conversation, I think the big thing is, is that when I pitched this to the three of them to talk about it, and, and I think I've even said this before on the past all wine hours, is that SIP certification or just sustainability in general isn't just a marketing term to get somebody to potentially buy something uh, just because it just says that on the label. Um, I think Beth put it really well in how they're shopping their values. And, and the certification process is quite lengthy. Uh, and I mean, it's, it's not easy. They don't make it easy for you to just sit there and say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm sustainable. So can I have a sign please? Mm -hmm. Beth, I want you to go through, just give the audience a little snippet of what it takes to become sustainable certified. Sure. Well, maybe I'll define sustainability first because it is a really yeah. big topic. So sustainability is about being more than green. We're meeting today's needs without preventing the future from meeting theirs. And we like to talk about the three Ps, which is people, planet, prosperity. And what the certification program does is it takes a holistic look, block to bottle, because we have a vineyard and a winery certification program of every aspect so that the wine growers are implementing the best practices based off of current science and research. So they implement practices that cover everything from how they're preserving their natural habitat to conserving water use, to air quality, to soil nutrition, all the way into how they take care of their staff that are actually making these wines and how they're a member of their community. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. That's pretty interesting because it isn't just about the grapes and the dirt and the process, but it's actually all about the people as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Our people are our most valuable resource and you know we don't get any of the work done without them. So there's a ton of uh, questions, you know, in the program, they're called the standards. Those are the rules that look at continuing education. How do you develop and build your staff so that they can grow with your organization? How do you give back to your community? You know, how are you developing a sustainable business program so that you can continue to have good practices with the people on the planet? Hmm. Remind me again when the program started. So we launched the vineyard certification in 2008 and we added the winery program in 2016. And today there's about 49 million bottles of wine that have the SIP logo on the label. But our program actually goes back even further than that. So we're a project of the nonprofit vineyard team and our mission has been to educate on sustainable vineyard farming. Oh, great, yeah, there's the logo on the Niner bottle. <laughs> so we wrote the first self-assessment for sustainable vineyard farming in 1996. And that was the foundation for what's now SIP certified. But education is still just a huge component of everything that our organization does. So lately, yeah. we've been doing a lot of online trainings, but historically, we would do in the field education on whatever's a resource issue, whether it be irrigation efficiency, safety trainings, pest management. And so that's still a big, big component of what we're doing. The, the, you didn't have a template necessarily. You, I mean, you, you made the template, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the whole intent of that original self-assessment was to be a learning tool. 
And so we would have wine growers come in and answer this questionnaire out of a thousand points. So, you know, what specific practices were they doing to preserve their habitat? You know, what irrigation efficiency programs do they have in place? All of the different components. They'd get a score at the end of the day. And we would also recommend that they find practices that they weren't doing to consider implementing them. And we'd have people come back, take the self-assessment again year over year to see if they would actually improve their scores. And we found that they did, it really worked. It was a great learning tool. People were learning new practices because of it. We also think people are a little bit self-competitive and wanted to get a better grade. <laughs> and we find that certification still works that way too, because we're always updating it with our committees. We do external peer review every five years. So we're always elevating what it means to be sustainable. And speaking of committees now, Katie, you're, you're on one of these committees, isn't that right? The, uh, with Vineyard team? It's hilarious because I am the only non-vineyard person on in that room and I'm the only one not understanding what's happening 95% of the time. But I will tell you guys that they really do care and they're talking about mealybugs and irrigation problems and all this stuff. They're in the details and they debate heavily. Is that fair, Beth? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So why, what motivated you guys, Niner Wine Estates, out the SIP certification uh, uh, for, for the brand? We have been, the vineyards have been certified since about 2014. And then Beth, I think you approached Molly actually, or Chris might have um, in 2016. And we kind of helped pilot the winery certification. And yep. the inspiration there was really, so you put all this work into the vineyard. And that's great. That was certified. We had a third party audit, which was really important to us. Um, but then you bring the wine into the winery and you have all these other options past that. And we weren't really measuring or tracking that. So that kind of led us down the second path of, okay, let's get the winery certified. Let's measure our use and kind of start tracking that. So it just kind of completed the whole picture there. Hey, before, uh, Michael, I got a question for you. Um, we have a question actually over in the Q&A that I would love to pose. Uh, and Beth, I'm sure this is, this is really meant for you, is how does one maintain their SIP certification and what evidence is used? Oh, that's a great question. So the way the program works is the vineyard and the winery certification is annual. And so we have those standards. So all of the practices that they need to implement they're broken out into two different types of questions. We have certain things that are called requirements. So these are what we would consider to be good sustainable practices for any operation. So that could be measuring your water use, having continuing education, growing a cover crop, specific items that are going to need to be done for anybody going through the certification. And then there's other standards that they need to get a certain amount of points in. They have to get at least 50% of the points. In farming, in making wine is different depending on your location and your facility. So people are going to have different climates, different resource concerns, you know, different scales. And so that's where you allow some flexibility for people to do their best work uh, where they have, where they're at. And so they have to document everything. We do have independent inspectors, so they aren't employees of our organization. That way it is truly third party who's verifying the documentation. We do on-site inspections as well. And that happens on an annual basis. That was my proof right there. Our, our lights just went out because they didn't move. That's all on timers. <laughs> so that's gonna happen again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, Michael, so uh, I was at your property. You guys display your, and I'll, I'll bring up some pictures here in, in a minute, um, maybe while you're talking, but your <clears throat> and the vineyard there, uh, you also have an Angus program. And I'm really curious as to, does this SIP certificate, like how does that work now with the, the animals that you have there and, and all of that? I'm just, to be perfectly honest, super curious how that works. Well, um, when my partner Chris Bear bought the property back in 1996, um, his original intent was to be a cattle rancher, cattle farmer, grow Angus beef. And then right around 2000 was when uh, wine was becoming really big in Paso, so uh, he put in the vineyards. Uh, so it was always part of the background, uh, the Angus production um, of our property. We've got um, 90 acres total. And of that, you know, 15 is vine vineyard and the rest is grazing land for the cattle. So we kind of uh, leave that green to um, 
produce grasses and it isn't heavily farmed. It's just uh, grazed land. Also, uh, we have sheep and alpacas on the property. And I mean, these are things that are part of the certification and they're fun to talk about and they show off really easy because people come to the tasting room and you know, you got a alpaca walking outside. So it's, it's a talking point that lets us bring up things that we have going on. But we'll use them uh, in the vineyard for weed mitigation. Uh, it's a lot lighter to have uh, sheep walk around in the vineyard and munch down the weeds than to drive a tractor through there. So that's you know something that we use that kind of um, is fun, it's visual, and again, it allows us to tell a story to our customers. And um, earlier, I mean, I was uh, walking in the tasting or, or in our exterior tasting area not too long ago. And we had a couple that was in here uh, from Southern California and they searched us, searched us out specifically because we we're SIP certified. So, you know, that gave me something to talk about. They enjoyed the wines and it was, you know, uh, a nice aspect of it. But, you know, back to our history, Osa Libre, we were, well, I guess, one of the first uh, back in 2010 to be SIP certified. Um, and I remember, um, I wasn't working here full time back then, but um, I remember going to one of the in initial SIP certification things where the binder was set in front of me and, you know, it's about this thick. And so I start flipping through it. And I mean, there's a lot involved in it, but you start going through it and I'll, you know, it makes sense. It's just, oh, I haven't thought about that or, you know, the things that you didn't get points for, it's just things you, you kind of realize, hey, this makes sense and it, it's good for all those involved. So you start moving down that path and eventually you start checking more boxes and uh, you get closer and closer to where you can be certified. That's cool. Uh, I put up this picture here I I when I came out the other day to uh, pick up some of the wines and drop off wines, uh, which we'll get into some wines here in a, in a minute, um, that I just loved how that huge SIP certification sign is on that fence down there, which uh, right next to your Angus sign, uh, it's you know proudly displayed, but I should say it's like you have a lot of SIP certification signs on the property because then there's this one as well, where this is where some of your llamas are and and then you have your, uh, your, your sign right there as you're leaving the gate on, yep. uh, on an owl box, which uh, is, is quite fancy. I think, uh, Beth, you mentioned something about uh, where these owl boxes came from. Yeah, so for a few years, pg &E was offering grants for owl boxes. They had problems with people putting boxes on utility poles, which isn't you know, good for the owls. So they were funding, <laughs> they were funding this program and education to go along with it, which was really, really interesting. So we were able to give away owl boxes for a number of years in a row. And these are like very nice, like fancy owl boxes. And the person who designed them is Mark Brown, I believe is a, like a researcher. We've done some great podcasts with him on sustainable wine growing. And it's just fascinating, you know, how far they actually will fly. He did some tests and found that they, they thought they were only going like 50 miles, but it turns out they were going into like states and states away and then coming back and just ending up 50 miles away. <laughs> but they're very efficient, you know, they're not particularly territorial, so you can put these boxes up, you know, all over the property and they're little go forgetters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they put them to work, right? On our property. Mm -hmm. We got 12 on our property. Oh, wow. Yeah. What kind of owls are they? Uh, they're barn owls. And uh, uh, last year, we kind of do a um, uh, check for outlets um, in the springtime. We kind of put an iPhone on a stick and just walk around and kind of shove it in the hole and we can, you know, kind of get an inventory of how many outlets we have. Kind of a fun little thing. We posted one on Facebook last year. Oh, cool. They're kind of uh, scrawny and thin when they're, they're young, for sure. I, I love going over to an owl box, especially, you know, when we do our vineyard tours with journalists or with sommeliers and the like, and you go there and you see all of the little bones and things that are down at the base of the box. And uh, it's like evidence that they're doing their job, you know, it's pretty neat. Hey, we have a question from uh, over on the Facebook side of things uh, that I, it, it probably leads to a kind of a larger conversation even on how maybe organic farming or biodynamic farming or what Tablas is doing with their re regenerative organic certification, how that works with um, the SIP certification process. Like uh, how is it different or do they complement each other? Can you talk a little bit about that, Beth? 
Yeah, definitely. They absolutely complement each other. And there's a lot of overlap in, you know, organic certification and SIP certified around preserving the habitat, around soil quality. And what sustainability does is it looks at those other aspects too. So that's where we're also addressing air quality, human resource issues, recycling, packaging. And a lot of regenerative agriculture is a very popular uh, term that you hear a lot now. And a lot of regenerative agricultural practices are actually already kind of built into the SIP certified program. You know, so something like growing cover crops is a way to help replenish the soil, prevent erosion, provide, you know, a habitat for beneficial insects. Like that's a regenerative practice. Um, another thing that you'll see is something like what Oso Libre is doing where you're diversifying what you're producing on your property. You know, so you're kind of balancing out your land use so that you're not over, you know, grazing in one area for cattle, but you also have options of having the vineyard there as well, preserving natural habitat. And so that creates more biodiversity on your property, which tends to make everything healthier in the long run. Yeah. Michael, uh, talk about the marketing aspect of it, because uh, we're going to ask Katie this too, but she's, she's not on screen right now. Um, but I want to know, does it sell wine? I mean, you said that you had people come just because of the certification, but I mean, what, what are you seeing from the consumer side of things? I, I would say, so, you know, we at Osa Libre started years ago, and I think it was something that, or it was something that we wanted to do for us. It wasn't really so much sales in mind, but it was something, you know, that Chris felt very strongly about and, you know, move forward with that. Um, a few years ago, dealing with it, um, I think that it was maybe a talking point, but it hadn't really grasped traction yet. You had people kind of asking a little bit, a little bit about organic grapes, but um, not so much the sustainability. And but part of what um, you know, SIP certification is is teaching the public and bringing about that education. And back to you know being primarily on premise and direct to consumer people find us and come talk to us or they hear from somebody, but now a large amount of people that come, I wanna say come through the door, they're not coming through the door anymore. They're coming onto the property, but you know, people that come seek us out, you know, have questions about it. And when they sit on the patio, they see the barn that you showed a picture of and they see the animals walking around or they see the owl boxes and I can point out, you know, bald eagles that fly around. So it helps, it, it's uh, like, it's, you know, something that helps us tell our story. That's who we are. So I don't know that it's really, you know, what we went into as a marketing ploy, but I mean, people are receptive of it. People come search us out and it helps convert some people. Yeah. Katie, kind of the same question to you. And you probably, I'm not sure if you heard it uh, as you were transitioning back in. Um, but from a marketing standpoint, I mean, you have it on the label, and I'm sorry, Michael, I didn't look to see if you had uh, it on of yours as well. Not, um, does that resonate with people uh, that having that SIP certification thing on your label? Because you also have wines in distribution, and and I'm I'm wondering how that resonates, say, with buyers out there. I think it resonates. It's always hard to tell. Beth actually has done um, worked on some studies that she could probably elaborate on the three tier market a little better. because They've invested to study that. And the answer was, yes, people care about um, a certification and they care that someone else is certifying it. I could say that we're something certified and put a stamp on there. And if someone's not checking that, I think it loses its authenticity a little bit. Um, Beth, is that what you found when you did that yeah, study? Totally. And, you know, like with anything, I kind of like the story that Michael was saying, how you didn't choose to get SIP certified for a marketing effort. And we find that to be true across the board with all of our members. No one's doing it for marketing. They do it because they think it's the right thing to do. And then it can be used as, as a marketing tool. You know, it's a way of communicating the work that you're doing and it's a part of your story. Otherwise you wouldn't go through this process because it is rigorous. It is time, it is effort, it is energy, you know, to practice farming this way and to get certified through it. But there's definitely a growing consumer segment that cares about sustainability. I just saw some research from Wine Intelligence that said that U.S. wine consumers are willing to pay $3 more on average for a wine that was produced sustainably. And there was some other research by Full Glass that talked to trade. So people who are working 
for retail outlets and who are wine buyers. And what was really interesting was they were all trending upwards from when they did the first study in 2016 and then again in 2019 in growth of their interest in buying sustainable wines. So the study that we did was to put up retail displays in a couple of grocery stores on the Central Coast to see if it would influence people buying the wines. And so they were, you know, SIP certified signs saying that the wines were sustainably made. A lot of the wines that are in our program are selling for $20 a bottle and up. So what we found was in stores where our demographic matched that. So their shoppers were buying wines at $20 and up. The retail displays impacted sales significantly. So it has to be a match for the consumer segment that's buying that price point of bottle and then you know, cares about sustainable practices. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that you, all of that stuff that you just said about uh, how people are ready and willing to spend a little bit more money. Um, and <clears throat> what I also recently actually uh, fielded was a call from a Wine Institute where they have the SAQ, which is the, the governmental buying body, wine buying body of alcohol uh, up in Quebec, uh, that they're looking to actually source wines from Paso uh, that are considered sustainable. However, they're into wanting to utilize the California Sustainable uh, Wine Growers Alliance's designation, which is a different designation, of course, than SIP. Can you tell me a little bit about what the difference is between these two? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so within, you know, California and the states and the country, you know, the world, <laughs> there's different sustainability certifications. And of course, there's similarities with them in the goal of, you know, addressing different types of holistic practices. Um, the Wine Institute's program was really intended to buoy the California industry into being more sustainable overall. So helping raise, you know, everybody up. And with SIP certified, we looked to make a program that was going to be distinctive um, and, you know, really rigorous. So that was, you know, one of our intents with the certification program. And we've also been able to actually go outside of California lines too. So we have a couple of properties in Michigan that are certified as well now. Yeah, we have a question over in the chat about SIP certification and can it extend to breweries and distilleries? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I've had people ask me about that a few times over the years and it's never got to that point, but I've had people use, the program still available as a self-assessment for free. So I've certainly had people in different areas look at it for that. Um, and the original self-assessment has been used for other crops. So it's been used for cattle, uh, I think stone fruit, citrus, some row crops. So it's been modified for a number of different agricultural products, not into certification, but as self-assessment. Yeah, mm -hmm. really cool. I, uh, and then talk a little bit about the, how did some of those vineyards that are out of the area, out of California, because this, by the way, this program now is, I mean, it's obviously, it's pretty huge. How many wineries and properties would you say are SIP certified now? Yeah, we have over 42,000 acres. And then there's the 49 million bottles of wine that have the, the logo on the label. Yeah. 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 And so how we got started in Michigan is the uh, woman who owns Waterfire out there actually found us. She was looking for a sustainable certification. And I guess she looked around at a number of different programs and she really liked SIP certified. And so she just reached out to see if it was possible. <laughs> it's a certifier vineyard. And, you know, we ran a pilot with her and it worked out great. You know, for the, we weren't sure because the growing conditions in Michigan are rather different from here. But what we found is that 99% of our questions worked fine for Michigan. The only areas where we made some changes had to do with water because they don't have the same uh, resource issues that we do. You know, a lot of their properties don't even have irrigation systems. So some of the things that make sense to do out here, like having a distribution uniformity test or having well pump tests, uh, they just don't even have that. <laughs> but so it was like small, small changes to make it still work well in a different climate. Uh, Katie, I'm wondering about, so you have LEED certification, uh, which I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, but also how that maybe even works into your, your SIP certification. Yes, I think the two are super complementary, and this is kind of how I explain it to people. LEED certifies our building, and it says, this is a great building. You guys did a good job. Um, we're solar powered. You have good insulation. 
I could leave all the lights on. You guys see my lights keep turning off. I could leave all the lights on. I could open all the taps in the winery and leave for the weekend and it would not be a sustainable building. SIP helps us measure how we're actually using what is a good, bo good bones at the facility. Yeah. And, and then who certifies or like what the talk, the lead certification, L-E-E-D, um, what does that stand for and who's actually giving you that certification? So that is the U.S. Green Building Council. You're certified one time upon completion of your building project. And it's leadership in energy efficient, does energy efficiency or environmental design? You're quizzing me on an acronym. I don't often explain, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a stamp you got uh, when the building went up in 2010. Yeah. We got, hey, you guys are, you know, lead certified. So it's a one-time thing um, where SIP is every three years. We're actually in our third year cycle this year. So we're going to get a full audit um, this year. And then we go back to paper, less intense, and you go back to a three-year. Yeah. And the, do you get a break at all uh, since you're on the board or on the on the committee with, of Beth's? I don't have to do the paperwork. So I get the biggest break of all. Molly Bowman, our winemaker, does that big binder. Although I was telling Beth earlier, it's all digital now. So Molly's very grateful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's probably a little bit more of a sustainable model too, is uh, losing all that paper, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because the, the binders used to be <laughs> huge. You know, back in the day, people would be stuffing in like all their soils tests, their tissues tests, just everything. So they were massive. And yeah, eventually we built a database so that people can just upload everything online. And it streamlines everything. I mean, that way it all lives in one spot. Your inspector, you know, can log in and check things on there and it, made it a lot more efficient too, as opposed to like shipping the binder somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Molly was saying she still gets great ideas reading, reading through that certification. You know, all the things that you can do. It's like, oh, I hadn't thought of that. And just having that resource and using SIP really as a framework mm -hmm. is very helpful where you just get inspiration because everyone's, everyone doing sustainability imperfectly is better than three of us doing it totally perfectly. And there's always kind of room to grow. And it's funny to think of the application as a tool, but Molly was like, yeah, actually, it makes me think. Mm -hmm. Beth, do you uh, end up having maybe new uh, like goals or achievable goals that kind of come to you since you've created the program, since Vineyard Team created the program? Uh, are there new things that come at you that are like, okay, here's a new thing that you need to check off in your self-assessment in your self for, you know, 2020 and 2021 and so on. Yeah, absolutely. So the way that the program works is it was developed by our technical advisory committee. So it's a group of people. Originally it was, you know, growers and now we have a winery segment as well. And so we do review a few chapters in full. There's 14 chapters total every year. And then if I get any recommendations or comments in from our stakeholders, I track all of that. So every single year I'm sitting down with them and we're reviewing these chapters and seeing like, hey, are there any practices in here that are maybe very commonplace, like we don't need to be addressing them, you know, and, and there's just something new that we want to replace that practice with. And in addition to that, every five years, we have it externally peer reviewed. So in that case, I would send the relevant chapters out to experts in the field. So that could be somebody who works with, you know, the California Extension Service or professors out of Cornell, um, people who work at the Environmental Protection Agency. And then that allows us to take all of their expertise and feed it back into that program. So it's always being changed a little bit year over year. Hmm. That's all right, right on, that's cool. When, when that does happen, um, I mean, are they really massive changes or is it just kind of moving little, little things around? It depends. You know, I, I know at one point we added in, it was a bigger change, um, like full like nitrogen calculations for any fertilizer that's added. And so like that was an example of a bigger change, you know, cause it's a you know, bit of a process to go through that and gather all the data and crunch the numbers. You know, and some things might be a bit smaller. So it just sort of depends on what's most relevant okay. at the time. Michael, you've probably gone through uh, some some of the recertification processes. Is there one thing on that whole process that you're like, ah, that's tough, or like, oh, or or you know, that's that's the hardest one, the hardest box to check? No, actually, uh, Janine on the property does all our certification stuff, so that's <laughs> one. Uh, I don't, I, you know, I've done it a couple times, the self assessment, but 
don't know exactly what she works on, but I'll just, uh, here's one, it's a, it's a weird, funny story, but shows, you know, the evolution of stuff you're asking about big changes. So I collect old books, old viticultural books, things like that. And I have a book from University of California printed in 1963. And there was a picture of a guy driving a tractor with a spray rig on it. And so this was, you know, approved way back then. Don't cringe too much. But the paragraph says, judicial uses of DDT are a great source of maintaining health in the vineyard. And I, I love, you know, just to show how much things have changed and, you know, people believe one thing and things change dramatically. So. Yeah, <laughs> gnarly. Uh, can you taste, Michael, this is a cheeky question, but can you taste the difference in wine? So I, I used this earlier today and it goes to uh, uh, some, a seminar I went to probably 2004 with somebody to talk about biodynamic wines. And he, he started out with saying, you know, bi biodynamic wines, they're not better than regular wines, they're different. And so then bringing it into the sip thing, back then, you know, people were going, oh, I'm gonna do biodynamic. And they were following, I guess, following the practices, but they weren't really grasping everything. So the results weren't all that great. And now, you know, as you move along, I don't know that you can, you can really find big differences, but keeping things more sustainable in a positive moving direction, the wines can be as good and now better than they were in the past. So I don't know if that really answers it or not. You know, <laughs> they are the same, but you can always make something better. And if through education and learning, you know, you can make them better using better practices. Yeah. So today, uh, let's talk about this wine while, you, while, while you've got the screen. Uh, okay. We have the Oso Libre 2017. It's a Syrah Moved Tanat blend of 40 Syrah, 30 Moved, and 30% Tanat. Um, and this is, uh, it sounds like it's all from your ranch, right? Or, or is it? Uh, this is the, uh, the Movedra is off the estate. And then uh, the Saran Tanat uh, I got from uh, Domenico Estate, Lavigne Winery, where I was winemaker for many years. And um, it just is a nice compliment. Uh, the Rhone that we grow on the property is the Movedra. And um, we've used Carnal as one of our fan favorite wines uh, since we opened. I think the first vintage was 2007 of this particular blend. Um, and the varieties have changed as we've moved along, but the taste is always similar. And um, the previous vintage of the 2015 had Grenache on it and not Tanat. No, it had Tanat, it didn't have Syrah. But um, the vineyard that I was working with in the past, the flavor profiles are very similar. And comparing the two, um, it, I mean, it tastes very similar, just kind of a vin vintage difference. Mm -hmm. um, it's got, um, the Movedra is kind of what stands out in it. It's got a nice earthy characteristic that is balanced by the uh, black fruit, fruit of the Syrah. And you know, I've been working with Tanat since 2003. That just kind of brings in a little um, structure to the wine, makes it uh, kind of adds a little bit of length to it. I know that uh, Tanat isn't technically a Rhone, but it kind of falls into a lot of Rhone blends around Paso. Um, great variety. And then, you know, for this wine, kind of brings out those rustic character characteristics that we all like. So. Yeah, delicious wine that's uh, really full in the mouth. Uh, a lot of uh, great tannin that uh, exists in it that it really kind of coats the tongue, but then uh, it really kind of has this really freshness of fruit and everything in, in the mouth. I really dig this wine. I've got a question for you about this wine and what you were saying on the Tanat coming from another vineyard. So and, and maybe Beth, you could even shed some light on this is can you put SIP certified on your label if you're 
your home ranch and everything, you're, you're 100% certified SIP certification. But then if you're sourcing fruit from someplace that isn't SIP certified and it goes into that wine, I mean, is it kind of like an Appalachian thing, you know, that 85%? Can you actually do that? Yeah, so any wine that has the logo on the bottle has gone through its own audit to show that it's at least 85% certified fruit. So that oh, would okay. enable somebody to, you know, if they were sourcing fruit, they could source from certified properties, you know, or use what they have on their own property. And so there's a number of brands that will, um, you know, that maybe don't have their own vineyard, but they can still SIP certify their wines because they're coming off of SIP properties. Okay, wow. Very cool. And, and it's actually an 85% too. Yes, just, just like uh, for AVA, basically. Um, yes. And that was intentional so that it wasn't throwing out like another percentage for people to remember. <laughs> yeah, that's the last thing, right? Because there's the 75, 85, 95 that, it, it already, that we already deal with, right? So Katie, what do you think of this wine? I think it's delicious. I love that Moved earthy impact. It's just smooth. It's making me want dinner at mm -hmm. four o'clock. <laughs> I'm officially getting old. I think it's delightful. Talk, Katie, talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing over there with Vineyard Team. And you're on a committee. You guys also have a, another program that uh, you were talking about uh, that you wanted to uh, share with everyone. Yeah, I think the Vineyard Team and SIP is really cool. And I feel like until I chatted with Beth in detail, it was a little complicated because there is vineyard certification, a winery certification, and the bottles can be certified. Um, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. This darn, this is rustic Paso, everyone, okay? We have bad Wi-Fi, I do apologize. <laughs> um, and so there's only the certification. certification, but there's a core group of wineries <laughs> is that a part of bad Wi-Fi? I think there's a core group of wineries behind all of those certifications. Um, <laughs> now we can't tell. Beth, you should talk about the scholarship. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think we've already talked about how, you know, the people are a really important part of any, any business that's going to do work sustainably. And so something that our organization has done is we started an educational scholarship fund to help the children of our members workers. And so it's been around since 1995 and we've raised $96,000 since then to help fund higher education. And many of our recipients, I think nearly all of them have been first time college students. So it really has been a phenomenal way to give back, to help people achieve their goals and really better you know, what, what they want their future to look like. Niner's been a huge, huge supporter of this program. Right now we're accepting applications through the end of the month. And you can learn more at vineyardteam.org slash scholarship. And that's also where you can donate. Niner is matching. So we're really trying to um, you know, reach our goal for this year so that we can fund as many scholarships as possible. And Katie's been instrumental on that committee for a number of years now. And how many, how many have you done? And, 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 Let's and how see. Well, since 2015, and then the number of recipients has varied year to year. I mean, some years I think we've had five recipients and last year we had a larger number. I think we had maybe 10 or eight. So it sort of depends on, you know, the amount of funding that we have coming in. Okay. And, and what, what does that look like as far as uh, funding coming in when, uh, is, like, where, where is it coming from and everything again? It's donations. So like Niner has been a big supporter. We've had a number of different, um, you know, companies and individuals that will donate to the scholarship and a hundred percent of donations go right to it. So any, any money that comes in is going to go directly to a student. Fantastic. And where can people donate if they wanted to? Yeah, go to vineyardteam.org slash scholarship and there will be a donate button right on that page. Excellent, very cool. Uh, let's also talk uh, after, we're gonna go to Katie here. Uh, I think her internet is working and uh, we're maybe gonna use a, a, a good open window. <laughs> yeah. Katie, she did a Zoom, she says earlier, and all, all was well. And now all of a sudden the uh, winds shifted and uh, we're, uh, we're dealing with some funny, funny Wi-Fi issues, but next up online, because we 
this is still a wine show, uh, is Niner Wine Estates Heart Hill Vineyard 2017 Twisted Spur. With the Twisted Spur. And I want to know, Hewitt, how that 2012 is tasting. We have the, I gave you guys a bottle of the 2017. And it's fun to taste it next to the Oso Libre because they're both based in Westside Syrah. Um, and where Michael went, Moved and Tanat, ours is Syrah, Cab, Petit Verdot, and some uh, wine. I have to pour some actually. And Hewitt's, let us know how that's tasting. I'm fascinated. I haven't, we don't even have 2012 at the winery anymore. My internet out again. You're back. You're back. You're back. Yeah. yeah. It was like stock film. I'm the worst participant on this. <laughs> um, so it's all Heart Hill fruit. We actually just put this on the tasting flight in time for Zinfest weekend. So come on by over the next couple months. Uh, we make a couple hundred cases. It's winery only. Um, it's got that nice, as Michael was saying, that blue fruit, that Syrah. It's got some oomph from the cab and the Petit Verdot. It's a bigger wine. It'll hold on for a little while. And yeah, it's been really fun to pour for people. Wow. It's delicious. It does definitely has a lot of that blue fruit characteristics in it. Uh, it has a lot of salinity to it too. I, I find that uh, to like this, this certain minerality that really shines through great acid, beautiful, bright acid. Uh, Michael, talk a little bit about this wine. What do you think? I, I, for reasons you like, I, I really like the underlying kind of um, Bordeaux aspect to it. And then the blue fr fruit of the Syrah kind of Starts at the top and kind of smooths it out. I also like the fact there's Carmenere in it. That's cool. I like Carmenere, so there you go. Awesome. Beth, give us your impressions on some of these wines. And also, uh, it just in general, when, when you're tasting wine in Paso, because you actually get out there uh, and, and taste, what are your thoughts about Paso wines in general? Oh, I you know, I actually just really enjoy trying any kind of a wine. I just appreciate that experience. I think it's so fun and we live in such a unique area. So I love both of these. They're both feeling right up my alley. I get the dinner idea. I made um, corned beef and cabbage and I was thinking like something, I don't know, just like warm and cozy sounds great now. <laughs> but yeah, I think we're, we're really fortunate to, you know, to have ready access to all of these great wineries out here and tons of wonderful different things to try. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we're very lucky and very fortunate in Paso that we have, you know, about 200 brands in the area, maybe 140 or so uh, different tasting rooms to hit. And uh, this coming weekend, of course, we have Zinfest weekend, or what do we call it? It's uh, Vintage Paso Zinfandel weekend. It's a mouthful. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> should just be Zinfest, right? Uh, and, uh, and so it's a great weekend to uh, get out and go and, and uh, explore around Paso, uh, if you can, everybody watching, uh, if you're local or if you're coming to the area from outside of the area. Uh, hey, Michael, so on when it comes to uh, the Syrah that you're growing there, I just kind of off topic, but on topic, did you also grow Syrah over at the Lavigne property? Yes, uh, over there we had two blocks. I don't have any up here. So, oh, you don't have Syrah there. Okay, I was gonna ask you to make a comparison of growing Syrah, say over in uh, the Adelaida district where you're at there. You're in Adelaida or Willow Creek, sorry. Adelaida. Adelaida, yeah. Versus over in the Genesea or Estrella actually would be uh, the, the former um, vineyard. Were they SIP certified though? I don't, I don't think that- they, they um, I'd worked with them starting in probably 2012. We were making strives for it, but never really went through with the certification. Oh, okay, got it. But so um, on the differences between the East and the West, um, uh, for the most part, there's a lot more red fruit on East side stuff. Um, but the fruit kind of popped a little bit more. We're coming to the West side, Adelaide or Willow Creek. Uh, it's darker, kind of more juicy, I think. Um, it uh, definitely, different I, I, but it's you know the climate just a little bit cooler uh even the colors darker just being over, over here um i had a chance working with a different a couple different clones alban clone being one of them on the east side and that did make a color difference and a little bit of uh, i guess dark fruit characteristic came out of that clone 
but still just a little bit more heat brought it more red than blue. Hmm. All right, cool. Uh, we got a question for you from the Facebook side of things, uh, Michael. Uh, will Osa Libre ever be distributed throughout the country or just always through the winery? Um, I mean, we have a couple restaurants that support us in the Pass Rebels region and Los Angeles, but right now our model is to be direct to consumer and not really grow uh, to where we're in distribution. There might be a wine that show up, shows up here and there to, I guess, uh, oh, I guess is advertising to get the word out about who we are, but it isn't, uh, we're not planning on focus or shifting our focus to uh, distribution. Okay. Uh, if uh, whoever that was over on the Facebook side of things, let us know where you're at and uh, maybe we'll uh, <laughs> talk Michael and define distribution there. <laughs> uh, and then we also had uh, a comment. So Katie a minute ago had asked, uh, the Hewitts who are over here on the Zoom side of things, how that 12 is uh, is showing. And I actually, I want to I wanna say what uh, they said here, just for the Facebook side of things, if you're not reading on the Zoom chat, that the 12 is still showing tremendous fruit, blue and black, with a great leathery backbone. And it's a blend of, it looks like 58 uh, Petit Verdot, 29 Malbec, 10 Cab Franc, and 3% Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, and I love this part. It's like drinking wine while enjoying an old leather bound book. So what a great description. Thank you very much, uh, Steve and Martha for that. That's awesome. Uh, you guys, we're getting along on time here and I do wanna give you guys a little time also to talk a little bit about what you got coming up next actually. If you're doing something for Zinn Weekend or uh, maybe what's next at the winery, what's next in SIP certification, anything like that. Katie, why don't you go for it? I'll kick us off. Um, yeah, you guys are all open invite, come on out. Wine country is great right now, it's super safe. I do recommend reservations, plan a couple weeks out. You can just pop in um, most of our websites, make your reservation there. We are open daily right now, lunch and wine tasting. Um, we've got some special events coming up. If you guys want to do some socially distant wine country dinners, we're trying to make those really fun for people. I think everyone's excited to just get out and have a good time and it's a good time to visit over the next couple months. Right on. And uh, I know I was there uh, the other day picking up wine and uh, uh, I, I think I heard uh, Shelby say something about how you guys are booking way, way in advance for the restaurant. Uh, is that, is that right? Yeah, I think one of the really good things about COVID is we just totally set, we got rid of separate restaurant taste room seating. So when you make a reservation, you can do anything. It's a user's choice. Um, and yeah, on the weekends, it's about three weeks out at the moment. Always call us, say you're on the Paso Wine Zoom call. Say Katie said you could come in. <laughs> <laughs> so we're still you know, trying to figure that. out. Like, <laughs> a year later, we're all still figuring it out. But yeah, it's been good. <laughs> right on, right on. Michael, are you guys doing some something fun, burgers or something this coming up? Um, we are doing a burger day uh, on Saturday. Unfortunately, it's members only just because of the space that we have. Uh, but um, we're open on Friday. We're open seven days a week. Uh, Friday's pretty well booked up. But Sunday, we still have some openings. Uh, for those of you that are interested to come to Pass the Rebels, um, we're seeing bookings on weekends out a month, uh, two months now. Midweek is pretty easy to kind of just slide on in. Uh, rec we recommend a reservation if you could do it, just kind of helps us do staffing in the tasting room. And we appreciate that. Um, one last thing I just want to touch on with the SIP certification real quick. Um, you know, I talk about, you know, we got the alpacas and the sheep and the owl boxes and all those things that are visual, but underneath, you know, we uh, Beth was talking about the inputs of uh, water and nutrients and chemicals and all those things, those are smaller things that are easy for us to demonstrate or show off, but you know, they're all part of the program too that makes one complete program to kind of help us become better stewards of the land. So that was my wrap up there. <laughs> right on. Hey, the, the burgers. So if somebody wanted to become say a member this weekend and <laughs> and be able to come in and enjoy the, the burger day. Is, is that possible? 
Um, I have a couple, two top tables in at my 11 o'clock seating. Uh, but we, we do have seats available for our um, Wine for Paws weekend, April 10th. Okay, there you go. And then now the burgers themselves, the beef, is that coming off of your ranch? Yes. Uh, so on our burger days, the beef is estate Angus beef. All right. Very cool. Thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, websites and uh, real quick, Niner, uh, Katie Bruce. Our website? Yeah. www.ninerwine.com. Follow us on Instagram. That's better. That's where we're really posting updates. And I will say Beth does a great job with the SIP Instagram also. You guys should follow her. Shameless plug for Beth. And then what was the uh, retail, by the way, on this, this bottle of wine? What do you think it is, Chris? <laughs> 48. <laughs> This is uh this is retail for seventy five dollars in the tasting room. Um, I think we have about got one hundred and sixty cases, one hundred and eighty okay. cases left. <laughs> I wasn't thinking that it was valued at that. I just figured, you know, everybody says forty eight. It's forty eight. Forty eight dollars. No, I like I like you, Chris. I give you a nice bottle. <laughs> uh, you did. Thank you very much for that. I think it's about to get swiped by one of my uh, office mates here. Uh, and Michael, what was the retail on this one? The 17 Carnal is $63 retail. Uh, just received double gold at San Francisco Chronicle. Nice. Very Ooh. good. And website again for me for Oso Libre. And uh, www.osolibre.com. Uh, we're not in distribution, but you can order online. Excellent. Thank you. Beth, Vineyard Team uh, used to be called Central Coast Vineyard Team, but Vineyard Team does a lot more than SIP certification. What else? Yeah, so if you really like to geek out on viticulture, we are the spot for that. We do some really good online webinars. We have the Sustainable Wine Growing Podcast, where we get to interview experts from all over the world about all kinds of resource issues and different aspects of sustainability, even into business practices. So that's a great one to check out and subscribe to. Of course, the scholarship is on vineyardteam.org. And then for all things SIP, you would go to sipcertified.org. You can find a list of all of our members in the program. If you wanted to take a little sustainable wine tasting weekend, you can do that right there. There's a zip code finder, which is super handy. And then we also have a lot of you know, tools. If you're in the industry and you're looking for different marketing tips, ideas, information, we have a ton of great resources on that too. Excellent. What's next for you? Um, I mean, through this whole process, you know, you've moved SIP certification online and it sounds, and you know, we had lunch the other day and, and we talked a little bit about what the world looks like kind of in the future for SIP certification. What's happening? Yeah, well, you know, one thing that interestingly, I guess, came out of a rough 2020 was more online education that we're able to do both on technical farming practices and also on, you know, marketing aspects for, for those who are members of our SIP certified program. And so we've seen really, really great participation rates in those. So I think it's a new avenue where we can share even more information with more people um, that are outside of, you know, the Central Coast area, which is typically who we'd be, be talking with at our in-person events. And so that's been a big component of in SIP certified, what we've been focusing on lately is how can we help our members better educate their whole team so that they can incorporate sustainability into their brand story? Because it's already a big component of what they're doing. So how can they share that? All right, right on, right on. And then are you going to get out there this weekend and go and have a look at uh, uh, any of the wineries and the like uh, for Zen weekend? I should. I was getting kind of excited about it after everyone was talking about it. So I have to pop online and make my own little wine trail. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. If you go to PasoWine.com, everybody watching, uh, you'll be able to go over to uh, Vintage uh, Paso uh, Weekend, Zin Weekend. Uh, click on that and you can see what all the wineries are going to be doing. Of course, they're trying to make sure that people are socially separated. Everybody, they're following the right protocols. Everything is by reservation. Really, everything is by reservation now. Uh, and we're having some really nice weather. And so that's uh, actually kind of a nice thing to be able to get you out. And if you're itching to go out to the wineries and you're comfortable with it, uh, then go out and go wine tasting and go see what some people are doing this weekend uh, on PasoWine.com. Thank you very much, Beth. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Katie, so much for uh, being on uh, the SIP certification show. 
Uh, next week on the Paso Wine Hour, we are going to be talking about the El Pomar district. We're going to have a couple wineries on there who also are uh, growing their grapes in the El Pomar, and we're going to talk a little bit about what makes the El Pomar district unique. So stay tuned for that. You can go to PasoWine.com to see that or just follow us, of course, uh, if you're, you're already here on Facebook, so that's great. Or if you're over on Instagram, it's at Paso Wine. Uh, thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Great weekend. Thank you. See you, everyone.